Welcome back everyone. Today was the grand finale of the American Cup which was being held here in St. Louis. Now as most of you know I did not do a recap yesterday. Now there are definitely going to be people who say that oh you, he was angry, he was upset, didn't want to do a recap but there was a very simple reason I didn't do a recap which is I was actually very upset but more importantly I wanted to move past the past the games and focus on today. So we will dive in very briefly to the games that I played yesterday. We'll just start with one game specifically, which was I drew my first game in the classical format, and then I played the tiebreaker against Wesley in 10 plus 5. Now, we're not going to go through much of this game, but I will point out a couple of critical things. So this game was played, and we had the Berlin opening, Berlin defense, I should say. Wesley played this line with Castles, Knight d4, and c3. Now, again, this is all very standard theory. Those of you guys who have watched my recap for the channel for a very long time, you're obviously aware that I have played moves like d4 against players such as Timor Rajabov and and you know other grandmasters anyway i'm not really going to go through the game in depth but what i will say is there are a couple of critical moments so in this game we reach a critical moment here out of the opening where wesley had the two bishops and i had a bishop and a knight but white has the compromised pawn structure on the c file as well as potentially a weak pawn on e4 now wesley was maybe a little bit better he did not proceed to play this correctly and at a critical moment right about here i decided to play this move h4 followed by knight h5 now the concept behind playing h4 knight h5 was that i thought that my knight was really good on f4 because as the former world chess champion gary kasparov himself said a knife on f4 is worth at least one pawn now what i should have done in the game is i should have actually put the knight on d7 and played f6 here creating this connect five and then plopping the pony on e5 to get a great bastion now if i had done this i don't know if i would have won this first tiebreaker yesterday tiebreak game yesterday but i definitely would not have lost and so when i put this knight on f4 it was okay and probably there's a critical moment later where i could have made a repetition um Right here, where I played a6, where if I had gone knight to e6, it would have been a draw. Alas, I did not do that, which meant that I went on to play some shaky moves. Wesley, of course, found some good attacking ideas on the queen side. Eventually, I would lose this game. Uh, it was still relatively okay up until this critical moment here when I played this bishop b8 move, forcing Wesley to play b5 and opening up the b file for the rook to jump. Now, again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds because we did have a lot of games today, but I had my chances, and when I threw those chances away, it was very, very upsetting. And what that means is that actually I did not look at any chess last night. I simply went out like a typical American, had some brewskis, and I played some pool, and I did not think about the game whatsoever. So I did go on to lose that game. Second game, I could not mount a comeback with the white pieces, which, which as the saying goes, here we and here we are today as I play against Wesley in a new match with the winner winning the whole event. So we started out by playing... Um, we started by playing 25 minutes plus 10 second increment and i decided to play one of these openings that i played a lot in the old days with the c4 e3 b3 knight f3 simply saying you know what i don't want to go deep into the weeds of chess theory who wants to do that in rapid chess or blitz chess? try to have some fun and just play like you've always played on the int intranets so this game was actually very standard here with this critical position right out of the opening where wesley knew his theory perfectly he simply knew that this position here leads to a uh, equal equal end game all these moves by the way very standard all all somewhat known i was hoping wesley wouldn't know this line but of course wesley is somebody who studies a lot of chess he is a world championship challenger down the road probably so he seemed to know the line so what happens is, is we end up in this end game where white is maybe a little bit better because black has this weak isolated pawn, or as they say in Italiano, this Isolani on D5, which is just permanently a weakness. Unfortunately, against a player of Wesley's caliber, even though I was able to achieve the maximum here, where I eventually am able to win this pawn on D5, this is still a theoretical draw with a rook and four pawns versus a rook and three, as was illustrated in a famous game that was played in Norway chess some years ago between Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces and the extra pawn on the the king side versus some streamer by the name of Hikaru Nakamura. Now, Hikaru was able to draw that game, and so that is one illustrative example if you're looking for possibilities. However, having said that, there's also a very famous game with the four versus three where another former world chess champion, Gary Chess, also known as Gary Kasparov, actually lost to Jerome Piquet um, in one of the online events that was held on KasparovChess.com at the end of the 90s or into the early 2000s. At any rate, I, I try to win here with this extra pawn, but as we know in chess, one extra pawn in a rook and pawn endgame is nothing, and this game ends up petering out to a draw very, very quickly, and alas, it is what it is. I try, I try to do something, I shuffle all over the board, but eventually, I can't do anything. If I try to move my king up at some point, black will just check from the side. When I go king, king g2, 
he'll check the king when i go to h3 now my king is simply locked away in jail it can't come back to the center of the board and black just starts shuffling with the rook on the second rank and it's a very easy draw so i try to play f5 but wesley correctly keeps checking me from the side if i try to go back to g2 check and hide on h3 after takes and rook f6 trying to win the two pawns black simply is rook f2 here guarding the pawn and there's nothing i can do so I go king f4, he checks, I go king g5, checking king h6, trying to hide the king on the h file here, but it, to no avail. I end up here, theoretically, up one pawn, but as we know, with this lone rook pawn on the board and gets a player of Wesley's caliber, zero chances that I can win. So the game goes on for a few moves, and then for the classic memes here, I sack the rook with rook to g6, because of course, why not? Of course, after rook takes g6, I hung my rook. I should lose the game, but alas, I simply have no moves on the board because my king and my pawn are simply stuck on the rim. So this is what we call stalemate. So second stalemate in our match, which means the first tiebreak game is drawn. So let's move on to the second game. Now, the second game, I'm playing with the black pieces here. If I lose, I go home. If I win, I win the whole event. And if it's a draw, we move on to another set of tie breaks. So Wesley starts with E4. We get our classic Berlin defense once again. Wesley plays this very safe line with rookie one. Now, I was somewhat aware of this line. I thought Wesley might actually play this because he did beat me in the Berlin FIDE Grand Prix tiebreakers with this variation before. So this is all standard theory once again i castle and wesley plays knight c3 now this is one of the old lines i also used to play this a lot with the white pieces it's a very safe line what white is really hoping for is after knight e8 knight d5 and bishop d6 let's just say white plays rookie one there's this very long theoretical line with c6 knight to e3 bishop c7 knight to f5 d5 eyeing the knight check king h8 takes and d3 or g3 here i of course played this with the white piece against magnus carlson all the way back and i want to say 2014 i played it against levon aronian probably played against wesley and many others at any rate white has the two bishops here so white is maybe a little bit better but black should be able to hold with correct play so this is all pretty standard but instead wesley plays rookie two now there was a game that was played i want to say between maxime vashi lagrav and anish giri and maybe 2015 with this move and the reason that i remember this is because then i myself played rookie two i believe against anish giri in the london chess classic and i don't know the year you guys out there can look it up i want to say it was 2016 or 2017 but i also played rookie two rather than rookie one now on first glance it doesn't look like it makes a difference but there is one important point here if black plays c6 and knight e3 and bishop to c7 the standard approach after knight f5 d5 check king h8 takes takes and g3 here with the rook on e2 white will be able to create a double stack in one go by moving the rook to e1 whereas in the traditional lines with the rook on e1 it takes you one extra move here to get to get the double stack with a rook in front of the queen you have to move the rook then move the queen so white is hoping for a very slightly improved version by putting the rook on e2 right away now of course i haven't looked this line in a long time i'm obviously a streamer first but i vaguely recalled that in my game against anish he started to play normally with knight f6 and i didn't get anything whatsoever so i thought if anish played it i gotta play it too so we get knight takes f6 takes d4 and now i go b6 because while i would love to have a setup like this for example with the open diagonals of two b shops targeting the king side i can't really achieve that here because in this position the bishop is in the way of the pawn now i could try to move the bishop to f4 but this is actually a very bad move because after white trades and goes queen d3 white is getting the double stack instantly with the two towers maybe a kebab on the seventh rank maybe g3 as well and then potentially bishop to h3 so this position is very very scary for me to play and i think i'm in a lot of trouble so instead i play b6 this way my bishop remains on this diagonal and scoping out the pawn on h2 but i can try to put the bishop on b7 and target the pawn on g2 as well and once i get the bishop to b7 i can complete my development by bringing the rook to the center of the board so wesley plays queen to d3 i go bishop to b7 now i've got the great double op combo and i'm going to bring the last piece into the game wesley plays bishop d2 rook a e8 rook a e1 and here i play rook e6 now this move is completely fine but looking back on the game probably what i would have done if i could do it over again is probably i would have traded and played something like queen d8 with the idea of playing rook to e8 and trading the rooks now again this is pretty dank so don't worry about the specifics but the reason i would have done this is when you look at this position the pawn structure is symmetrical the pawns remain on the same files for both sides Whereas in the game, when I go rookie six, Wesley plays c4, very explosive move. I play rookie eight, and now he goes bishop c3 with the idea of potentially opening up this diagonal towards my queen and my pawn. 
Here I decide to play queen f4, which is not necessarily a bad move per se, but when I go queen f4, it was based on a pure miscalculation. Obviously, I'm hoping that West will play something like d5 here, blundering queen takes h2 checkmate, and then I win the match, we can go home, and I'm the champion. But of course, a player of Wesley's caliber, never going to blunder that, so he plays g3. I go queen f3, we trade the queens, Wesley takes, and now I take with the f pawn here. Now, what I probably should have done is I probably should have taken with the rook, but the thing is, initially, I was going to take with the rook, and I thought, well, okay, we trade, we've got two bishops on the board, even number of pawns, I mean, should be a very easy draw, not a whole lot going on. But as I realized during the game, when I was thinking thinking um, in this position, after rook takes e6, white can play this move bishop to h3, targeting the rook on e6, because the other bishop guards the rook at the end of the board. After rook takes rook, bishop takes rook, the computer thinks this is okay for black, but it's very tricky, because here I have this weakness on d7. I can't get rid of it, because the bishop's in the way of the pawn. And if I go bishop c6 to guard, then white goes d5, bishop to a4, and b3, trapping the bishop with the classic connect 4. I simply have no squares for the bishop. So when I saw bishop h3, I'm suddenly like, uh-oh, I can't do this. Now, computer, of course, says that after takes, takes bishop e2, b3, bishop d3. Black is still completely fine because when white takes, you have bishop to b1. Let's just say a3, and now you can, or not a3, sorry, let's just say a4. You can now go bishop to a2, winning one of these two pawns on either b3 or c4. Of course, a pathetic human like me, not capable of finding this, so I start to see the boogeyman, and I take with the f pawn. Wesley plays d5 here, and now I go bishop g4. I cannot capture the juicer, because then I simply lose the rook on e8, and with it, I lose the game. So I go bishop g4, Wesley plays bishop d3, I go rook d7, he takes, I take with the bishop here, and already at this point in the game, I thought, I should be able to draw this, even materially, both of our beautiful double ops aiming at different diagonals, but it feels like, objectively, this should be a draw. So Wesley plays king g2, I go bishop f7, b3 we swap the rooks and now i play bishop e5 now the interesting thing about this position is that i do have a pawn majority four versus three on the queen side but white also has a pawn majority on the king side with a three on two and objectively i think this position is easier for white to play because white has a very clear-cut plan of pushing p on the king side with like g4 h4 g5 f5 and just steamrolling the pawns i can't really create a pass pawn the obvious way to try and create a pass pawn is to go something like let's just say c6 and d5 but after pawn takes pawn if i take with the pawn here i have an isolated pawn that's blockaded by the bishop even if i get it to d4 the bishop prevents it from moving further down the board and if i take with the bishop just to illustrate a point here let's just say i go h6 if white gets to play bishop c4 even these end games are very tricky to play because white is still very fast with his pawns on the king side and it's very difficult for me to create a pass pawn on the queen side so here i, I play bishop to b2 Wesley proceeds to play bishop e4. I go c6, trying to maybe play d5, maybe also trying to play a6 and b5 as well to chip away at this connect three on the queen side. Wesley plays king f3. I go g6 here. Now, the idea behind g6 is I wanted to stop him from going bishop f5. My initial idea was to play this weird looking move pawn to a5, but I was very concerned that after bishop f5, d5 takes, I would have to take with the pawn because after bishop takes, bishop e4. Computer, I guess, thinks this is okay for black, but it looks very, very scary with the pawns being fixed on the color of the of the white dark square bishop, and my bishop can't touch the pawns on the queen side, so this looks very, very scary. Computer apparently thinks it's okay, but impossible in a blitz game to play like this. So after king to f3, I play g6 to stop bishop f5. Wesley plays g4, and now I go a5, and here he plays a4. What I'm hoping to do here is to trade off the pawns, because if we could magically trade off all these queenside pawns, even, for example, let's just say white somehow uh, white somehow ends up winning a pawn, just to illustrate it, let's just say d5, just to set it up. Even if we get to this endgame where white has three pawns versus two on the king side, this should be a very easy draw. So what I need to do here is I'm trying to get rid of some pawns on the queen side, trade them down so that this majority on the king side doesn't matter as much. So here, Wesley plays a4, trying to fix the pawns on the king side, or the queen side rather, and now I play this move d5, because now I have big problems here. I can't really play on the queen side easily. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to play on the queen side at this position. So I can't really play on the queen side. So if I can't play on the queen side, then I'm in big trouble. So here I play d5, he takes and I take back. And the goal that I had in mind after bishop c2 is I thought that now I could plop the bishop on c5, guarding the two pawns and now at least i can play d4 and go after the pawns that are on the light squares for wesley so we get bishop c3 
I play bishop to c5. He plays bishop e5. It's worth noting if white plays bishop f2 and trades here. White might even be a little bit worse here because these pawns are fixed on the same color as my light square bishop. And this bishop can't touch any of the pawns. Just to illustrate it, these pawns are on dark squares. These pawns are on light squares. My bishop sees his pawns. His bishop doesn't see mine. So... Wesley plays bishop c3, I go bishop c5, anchoring the bishop and the pawns here on the queen side, and now he plays bishop e5, and here I go king f8, he plays f5, I take, he takes, and now I play this move h6. Now, what I initially thought I would do was play, was play this move d4, but after bishop takes h7, bishop takes b3, and h4, I was very unsure of what was going on here, because white has two pawns on the queen side that are going down the board very fast, and my pawns on the queen side are extremely slow, and even this pawn in the center can be stopped by this bishop from h7. So when I saw this idea, at first glance, I thought I would play it, but then I realized if I do this, if, if I'm wrong and Wesley goes into this and I'm wrong, I'm just going to lose the game without a doubt. So I thought, you know, there's no in-between here since white is the two connected pawns, and I thought it's better to be safe than sorry. Because I assumed here after h6, as long as I don't allow a major imbalance with two pawns on the queen side or two pawns on the king side, that I will be able to draw the game with perfect play. So Wesley goes bishop f4, I play king g7, we repeat, and now he plays h4, I play d4 here. Now I'm targeting the pawn on b3 with my bishop, and meanwhile my bishop and my pawns are all very well placed in the center. So Wesley plays h5 here, which is a great move, and a move that I completely overlooked. Already here, I thought after bishop c2, d3, I was close to equalizing, because white probably should take and go bishop b5, and after king f7... Now we have a two-on-one where my bishop is guarding all the pawns. White can't really create passers on the king side easily. And even if he does, my king will blockade. Say g5, takes six, king g6. Very easy draw. So already here, I'm like, okay, it's going to be a draw. It's all good. We'll move on to the next set of tie breaks. And then Wesley plays h5. And I'm like, oh, something in my mind. Because as I realize, if I eat the pawn on b3, white can now go g5. And white is actually winning here. Because if I take the pawn and white goes h6 with these bishops on e5 and f5, I simply can't stop the pawn. I just can't stop it. My the, my king can't get to the g7 or g8 square easily. I mean, I can go to g8, but if I go king g8, h7, these bishops cover the two critical squares and it's game over. If I play bishop g8, h7, take six, this also is completely winning because at some point white will create the lock on the queen side and then gobble the pawns elsewhere. And it is the right color bishop just to illustrate the point. This end game is winning for white simply because when I put the king in the corner, this bishop covers the critical queening square, so this would be winning. So already here when Wesley plays h5, I'm like, uh-oh, what's going on? Have I thrown the game away? Luckily, I keep my wits about me, and I play this move king g8. Now, this move is very important because now on first glance, you think, well, white just goes g5, takes h6. Again, the, the pawn is just pushing towards the end of the board. Game over. But if white pushes g5 here, I can just take the pawn on h5 first with check, and then I should win the game. So Wesley goes bishop c2, I play d3 of course, bishop d1, I check, and now he goes king f4, and I play king h7. Now, it's a very tricky position here, because if white can exchange either set of bishops, white wins the game. So to illustrate the point, if I can magically trade trade the, the dark square bishops, white will end up winning this pawn on d3. And with that, white will win the game, because he has a two-on-one on the king side. So if white can trade the dark square bishops, white wins the game. Conversely, if white can trade the light square bishops, white also wins the game because now it's even worse since all my pawns here are on the same color as the as white's dark squared bishop. So here, this is also just losing because white will go bishop f4, king g7 to guard the pawn, king e4, uh-oh, spaghettio, I lose this pawn, and with it, I lose the game. To illustrate the reason why, I'll just set it up. At the right moment, white goes king b5, bishop c7, gobbles everything on the queen side, gg, finito, adios. So... I have to be very careful here. So Wesley plays bishop c3. No, white can't play bishop f3 because I take the pawn on b3. So he goes bishop c3, and here I play this move bishop g2. Now, the reason I played bishop g2 is already here I was getting scared of white's next move. I saw king g8, king e5, and I started to get concerned here that say I play like bishop b7, for example, white can somehow play a move like bishop d4 and potentially win the game. Now, the computer says after king g7 it's a draw, but I think king g7 might be the only move that saves the game here. If I trade, I lose the pawn. If I go bishop b4, I lose this pawn, and so it's complete catastrophe. So I play bishop g2. Wesley goes bishop f3, and here I go bishop f1, guarding this pawn from behind. And now my idea is that if white ever gets too wayward with his king, I can always play bishop b4, and after takes, takes, let's just say white goes king d6, now I can play bishop e2, offering the trade of the bishops. White, If white trades, I get a queen, and if white goes bishop e4 check, I go king g7, followed by d2 and d1, because my bishop covers the critical squares. 
So I played this bishop g2 idea with this concept in mind of putting the bishop on f1 and e2 if the king gets too wayward. And if white can't bring the king close, then it should be a draw. So here Wesley plays king e4, which apparently is a blunder. I can't fault Wesley for playing this move. Because at this point, it's, it's just very, very difficult. We don't have a lot of time. And there is certainly some pressure too. If Wesley slips here and his pawn gets through, he will lose the game and lose the match. So he goes king e4. I go king g8, bishop d2, king g7, simply guarding the pawn on h6 bishop c3 and now we do, do a two-fold repetition before Wesley decides to play on for more so he goes bishop f4 and now I play bishop f2 and we of course have a typical bishops party on the f file all the bishops are on the f file here uh it's not really clear whose bishops are better but the reason I went bishop f2 is that now if white tries, tries to get wayward with the king again I can go bishop e1 and then bishop e2 like this and now these two bishops cover the critical squares once again this bishop on e2 holds the pawn covers the d1 square the other bishop holds the d2 square and now I'm going to win because of d's bishops so I go bishop f2, Wesley checks, I go king f7, he goes back c3, and now I retreat with bishop c5 here, Wesley plays bishop e1, king g8, and now he makes a mistake by playing bishop to d2, which allows me to play king g7 and claim a threefold repetition, because this is the third time the position has occurred. Now those of you guys who are watching are probably unfamiliar with this rule, because normally the way a repetition works is three consecutive times with the position repeating, but there is a threefold where if you reach the same position three times, even if it's not in the same same order of the sequence, it is still a draw. Now, now just to show you where the repetitions occur, first time we have this position is right here with king g7 guarding the pawn. Second time we have the position is here, again, king on g7. And of course, the third and final time is right here. And as you can see from the arrows, it's a different position. So I'm able to get the threefold repetition, make the draw, and I breathe a big sigh of relief. So I draw this game. So what does this mean? We now move on to the 10 minute games. We have 10 minutes plus five second increment for move number one. And it's the same thing, two games. If they're drawn, two games of blitz and then our mega dawn. So Wesley decides to play e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6. And here he trots out the classic Gucci piano. Now, after bishop c4, I play knight to f6, d3. Wesley, of course, chooses not to go into the classic fried liver attack with knight g5. And after d5 takes, there are many ways black can play, but as everyone knows, il figatello in Italian, or the fried liver is what takes, takes, check, king e6, and knight to c3. It's an opening that's been played many, many times. Very, very popular and very famous. So Wesley decides he'd rather play the very quiet Gucci piano instead of going to the fried liver, so he plays d3. I play bishop c5, all very standard moves by the way here. Wesley and I have literally played this position more times than I can recall. And we get this standard position, which is pretty much known theory up to this point. Now after rook takes e6, white is a plethora of moves. In the chess global championship in Toronto back at the end of 2022, I believe Wesley played rook b1 here. Queen c2 is a move, rook b1's move, knight f1 is a move. I think bishop b2 is, is, is also one of the moves. And for anybody who's wondering and has an interest in buying a course on this, there is a course that's done by Jan Gustafsson from Germany. Sorry, I butchered the name. It's Jan Gustafsson, of course, um, who has a classic course on the Italian where he talks about a lot of these variations. So Wesley decides to play Bishop B2. Now, those of you guys who've been watching my channel and my streams and my YouTube videos for more than a year now will know that there's a famous grandmaster by the name of Lenier Dominguez from Cuba, now representing the United States of America, who has played this against me many times. In fact, in the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, I think in September of 22, uh, Bishop B2 was played by Dominguez, and I got a bad position. However, even though I'm a streamer first and not a professional chess player anymore, I still have time to look at some of these intricate lines before the games or even before the tournament begins. So I play knight e7, knight f1, knight g6, knight g3, and here I play this unusual move, knight to h7. Now the reason that I play knight h7 is when you look at this position, you'll notice that we have d's knights on the king side, which are mirroring, but it's basically a situation of if I could trade these knights off the board, I assume my bishop on a7 targeting this long diagonal is better than his bishop on b2 because it's blocked in by a pawn. So when I go knight h7, d4, and knight g5, what I'm angling for here is to simply trade off d's knights, because if d's knights are not on the board, then my bishop should be better than his bishop. So Wesley trades, he plays this move queen g4, and now I go rook a e8, trying to stack the towers here, putting a lot of pressure on Wesley's center. If Wesley plays d5 here, I'm very happy, because after rook f6, I have this gigantic file and this great diagonal for both my rook and my bishop which are spying the pawn on f2 so wesley doesn't want to open the center conversely since i now have the double stack if white just say trades and goes like knight f1 i can take on d4 and win the juicer on e4 so it's a very prophylactic move here by playing rook a e8 where i want to say okay i'm going to open the center and win the pawn or if you keep the center closed you open up the diagonal for my bishop 
Wesley decides to play rook a d1. I swap the queens here. I take. And now I play d5. Wesley goes king f1. I play f6. And already here, I was very, very happy with my position. And I thought I was simply better. If Wesley were to take the pawn here, we can swap the towers. And after knife to f4 here, threatening the pawn on g2 and d5, white's in some trouble. Now, after d6, maybe it's still equal. But it feels very difficult here because white has to be very careful with the weak pawn on g2. Also, maybe knight d5 targeting the pawn on b4. b4. And it feels like white's in some trouble. Maybe it's okay, according to the computer. But it feels iffy. So here, Wesley plays this move f3, and now I play this move c6. Now, I was actually mad at myself during the game for playing this move um, because I thought that I, I could maybe be sneaky with a move like bishop to b8 here. And so now if white takes, I can trade everything off in the center, go knife to f4. And now it's a little bit different because after king f1, knight takes d5, I get this great bastion where the knight targets the pawn. He has this isolated pawn on d4. So with these two weaknesses, black should be better so here instead i decide to play c6 wesley takes and now i decide to take on d5 which is a horrible horrible move at this point already i felt like i let an advantage slip now as we can tell from the eval bar there never was really a big advantage but in my mind i thought i was better maybe i was just being too optimistic and so here i did not want to trade off all the rooks and make a draw and so i decided to take on d5 instead now this is obviously a mistake for a couple of reasons first of all white has a great knight that's jumping to f5 this pawn on d4 is not a weakness because i have a pawn in front of it and so white also can maybe claim an open file and create a kebab with rook c1 or rook c7 so he does play rook c1 i go rook c6 wesley plays knight f5 and now here again inexplicably i play this move king f7 what i should have done here is i simply should have traded the rooks and gone bishop b8 now if white tries to win the pawn on d5 with knight e3 i have bishop f4 pinning the tail on the donkey and i'll just simply trade the bishop for the knight and go knight f8 knight e6 and i can never be in any danger of losing but of course, in my infinite wisdom here, again, I didn't really sense any danger. I thought, whatever, who cares? So I go king f7, Wesley plays b5, I trade, I trade, I go bishop, knight f8 here, and now suddenly I'm in a lot of trouble. Now, as you guys can see, much like yesterday, I was way up on the clock. I have four extra minutes, or maybe it's only three here, but I have a lot of extra time, but I start to panic for no good reason. Now, in this position, if I play the move bishop to b8, I was very worried about bishop to a3, because now my knight is a little bit iffy here. I don't have the e7 square to trade the knights. And if I go knight f4 here, white has bishop to d6, forcing a trade of the bishops, because if I don't trade the bishops, I'll lose knight or my bishop on b8, and this would be a disaster. And after takes, takes king e7, knight b7. Apparently, computer thinks this is okay, but with this outside pass pawn for white, this feels extremely scary here. So here I decide to play knight f8, Wesley checks, I go here, takes, takes, now Wesley finds an excellent move, bishop a3, this is not a move that I had seen at all, already here I thought I was completely fine, the line that I had looked at was king to e2, king to d7, bishop to e3, but after knight to e6, white simply doesn't have a whole lot, he can play knight a5, takes, takes, king c7, king b6, and the game should be a draw. But when Wesley plays this move, bishop to a3, again, I go, oh, something. Because knight d7 is a huge blunder, which loses the game on the spot to knight d8 check. I have no squares available for my king other than the e5 square. So because I have no squares available, I have to go up. Walking into the fork with knight c6, king's got to move. And when the king moves, I lose the bishop on d4, and I lose the game. So I play knight g6 here. Wesley goes knight d6. I play bishop b2, bishop b4, bishop c3. We have basically we do the tickle tickle here where i offer the trade of the bishop for the knight wesley plays bishop c5 and now finally he goes knight to b7 i take king b6 and he plays b6 now what's really amazing about this position is that the computer apparently thinks this is zeros now already here i was very very concerned because if I take the knight, white gets a new queen with b7 and b8. And my pawns on the king side are not great. White has this great formation here with the three pawns. Knight can come in and win this pawn very quickly. And I was already very, very scared. So I play knight to e5. Wesley goes b7, king c7. And now he plays king f2. What I felt in this position was that Wesley should have made the check, forking the king and the pawn. And after takes, takes, king c6, knight f5. I don't know if this is a draw or not. I was going to do this with knight takes h6 and d4 and start pushing p down the board as fast as I can. Computer thinks it's zeros, but I was really unsure during the game whether it was enough to save the game. As we can see, the computer thinks it is, but I wasn't I wasn't sure at all. So Wesley plays king f2. Now I play d4 here, trying to use this pass pawn, because if I can trade the b pawn for the d pawn, once again, this should be a draw, because white can't go after these pawns easily anymore, since he doesn't have the f5 square available to win the pawn in h6 or g7. So Wesley plays king e2, I go g6, king d2, and now I play h5, we swap, 
plays king e2 and now i find one last important move which is knight g6 now this move is very very important for a couple of reasons if i play h4 here white can actually go f4 and suddenly knight g6 king f3 starts to feel iffy now apparently f5 takes takes 97 is still a draw but if i'm wrong on even one move and i lose one or both of these pawns i lose the game and i more or less will lose the match so I, I have to be very, very careful here how I do this. So when I play knight g6, what I do is I stop white from pushing the pawn. And now if white ever goes g3, I will just play h4 to trade off more pawns. And even, even here, this is going to be a very easy draw because white only has this lone pawn on b7 on the board. So very similar to the other game where I was black, I'm trying to trade off the pawns as much as I can to give myself the best drawing chances. So Wesley goes king f2, I play h4, and now he checks, I take... And he takes and here i play king c7 which is actually a bad move at this point i had already zoned out i thought it was going to be just an instant draw and if i had realized that it wasn't going to be an instant draw i probably would have played this move knife to f four because now if white plays knight f5 attacking the pawn after h3 let's just say white goes g3 here attacking the knight i can go h2 and i win the game king has no squares to get next to the pawn and i'm going to get a queen at the end of the board so after h3 white white can try g4 but after h2 knight g3 king c6 my king is running very fast and it should be an easy draw so i played king c7 instead and now after wesley played king e3 i suddenly realized that not so fast the game goes on now fortunately because there's so few pawns on the board this should be a draw but if white had even one more pawn on the board this would be a win so to illustrate the point let me just try to set it up somehow um how do i set this up uh let's see i'm trying i'm trying to find the, the right way to set this up let's just say you have some end game where white has three versus two if white gets three pawns on the king side versus two i think this is still a draw i think it's a draw with perfect play but it's very tricky and if white actually has four on three so if white had an e pawn and black has an h pawn that is a win as was demonstrated i think i don't think i actually demonstrated but it was a line that i could have potentially had in a game against boris Gelfond in the fide grand prix in 2015 i believe it's in uh, Tash Ken, if I'm not mistaken, but again, that's beside the point. But due to the fact that there's so few pawns on the board at this point, um, it should be a draw, even though after king, king e4, I'm going to lose the h4 pawn. So I go king e7, king f5, king f7, king g4, and now white will win the pawn on h4 with the king or playing knight f5, knight takes. And so I decide just to jettison the pawn, and we get to the end game with the two versus one right away. I'm able to save this pretty routinely here. There isn't a whole lot of danger. As long as i don't get my knight trapped now one little trick that could have occurred later in the game was there was this funny position right here where if i play this move knight to e1 oh maybe it's still a draw because i guess after king e4 i have f5 here but if i don't have f5 i think after king e king g6 i should be losing or maybe not maybe it's still a draw maybe it's still a draw because i'm starting to realize now as i look at the position white can't actually trap the knight even though the knight has no squares all the squares are covered by his knight and his king he also can't bring the king around because if he tries to go around to win the knight then the knight gets out this way and you also can't go this way with the king because then you lose the pawn so it's still a draw but i, I didn't want to do this of course so i play king g6 f4 knight f2 we dance a little bit here i check knight d7 knight e3 check knight a4 of course important move this way the knight can always access the critical central square of e4 via c5 or via c3 as well wesley plays knight d5 i check king e7 knight to e4 and now he has to go g4 or else he loses the pawn i play f5 g5 and now i sack the knight because without any pawns on the board even though white has an extra horse here with a king and a knight you cannot checkmate the king even though you're up three points in material so very hard fought third game also ends in a draw and now we move to the second game of our 10 minute plus five second increment portion where i have the white pieces now i had a big internal debate with my second or not internal sorry external because internals would be with myself but i had a big debate with my trainer chris little john last night about what i should do if i were in such a situation now going into this match my general general feeling was in the 25 plus 10 i think we're about even i don't think i have any advantage whatsoever against a player of wesley's caliber now i felt in the 10 plus 5 i won the first day when wesley blunder our first match when wesley blundered with the white pieces in the sicilian yesterday in the first game with the black pieces i also had a big or not in sicilian yesterday in the first game i also had a big advantage in the berlin defense and so i felt that in the 10 plus 5 i had an advantage that being said our very first match which went into the blitz tie breaks i just dominated completely in the 3 plus 2 so i wasn't sure here what to do on the one hand i thought well maybe i should just play the berlin and make a draw with something like e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop b5 knight f6 takes d4 takes takes and just 
force the event into the classic blitz portion so i did consider doing this but then i thought to myself you know what you have the white pieces you've got to take a chance why why try to keep stretching out longer and longer for content you should go for the kill so i decided to play knight f3 d5 e3 like i did in the first white game of the day wesley plays knight to f6 c4 e6 we, we repeat basically i take and here instead of playing d4 like in the first game i decide to play this move rook c1 Wesley plays d4, trying to claim all the center immediately, and now I play this move knight to a4. Now, everyone who's watching is going to be like, well, Hikaru, you've always said knights on the rim are dim. Why are you putting a knight on the rim in the opening? What are you doing? You tell us one thing, you do something else. But before the game, or before the set of the 10 plus 5 games, I had a chance to very briefly review this, and even though it looks a little bit quirky, the knight is not stuck on the rim. If black trades the pawns, knight can always jump back to c3 or capture the pawn on c5. So the knight is just temporarily there to try and try and create some pressure. So here Wesley decides to take the pawn. Now before the game, I had also looked at some exciting lines like b6 takes and takes. Knight takes d4 and bishop b7, which is a very wild position because white has trouble finishing his development due to the fact that if you move the bishop, you lose the juicer on g2. And if you can't develop, say you play like knight c3, rook to e, or not rook e, sorry, you can't go knight c3 because that hangs the knight. But say you play a move like a3 and black gets rook e, all of a sudden you've got all kinds of problems here and black is developed very, very quickly and he'll probably even just win the game soon. So I spent all my time on this, but the danger of a danger of looking at openings with computers, especially when you don't have a lot of time to review, is that the moves that the computer suggests are not the moves that we as humans would consider if we haven't done a lot of deep review. So as soon as Wesley started thinking here, I was like, hmm, why can't Wesley just take the pawn on E3 and then play B6? And, and once he used some time and then actually did this, I felt like an idiot. Because the computer, of course, doesn't like D takes E3. Because after D takes E3, Queen takes D1, Rook takes D1. It thinks White is a little bit better in this end game. But I was like, you know what? I haven't reviewed it. I also don't want to play a queenless middle game, which is very likely going to be a draw. So I decided to take with the F pawn and create some imbalance. Wesley decides to play this move B6 here. And now I go bishop to E2, knight D5, castles, knight to C6, and I play queen E1. Now there's a little bit... A little bit silly it's very rudimentary but what i'm aiming for is i want to use a scoped bishop and play queen g3 and go for checkmate it's also important to note that i don't have a lot of plans here so it's very easy to play i can't really push in the center because then i lose the pawn and i get forked if i push the other pawn black gets a nice little knife here on on f4 and potentially a bastion on d4 later on so it's not really all that great so i can't push in the center i can maybe play a3 but b4 never is really a move either so I can't really push pawns in the center. I can't push P on the wing either. So queen to E1 and queen G3 is a very logical move. And in, in rapid and blitz specifically, it's better not to have a lot of options because then you don't have to spend as much time trying to decide. And that, that means that you'll be able to move quickly and you have very simple logical plans. So Wesley goes bishop b7. I go queen g3, trying to checkmate him in one and create the classic battery. He plays bishop f6. We trade, and now I go knight to c3, bringing the knight back from the rip. Now, the reason I played knight c3 here is I want to stop black from being able to jump in the center with his knight on f6. So Wesley plays this move knight to b4 after a bit of a think, using a little more than 30 seconds. Now, I was actually feeling very good about myself initially when I played knight to c3 here, but when Wesley was thinking, I actually became concerned about this move knight to e7. The reason I became concerned was from a pure conceptual standpoint. When I look at this position with the knight on c6, let's just say black plays knight a5 and I get knight h4, I have a clear-cut idea of going knife to f5. I've got a great open f file. I get that knife there. I go for mate on g7. Very, very logical, very free-flowing play. On the other hand, if I don't have knight to h4 as, as an idea, what is my plan really? If I'm not attacking with knight h4, knight f5, what is the plan? Again, I can't push p in the center with e4 because I just lose a pawn. If I play d4 here, which is a move, black can play maybe rook e8 with ideas like knife to f5, forking the queen and the pawn here, and it just feels very iffy. So I don't really want to push p in the center, but it's also very hard to do anything on the king side, because after knight to h4 here, black can actually just gobble the pawn and win the game, but excluding that point right off, black can also just play knight e4 here, trade, and I have these pawns that are not really all that great in the center, and I have literally, well not literally, I have less than any kind of attack on the king side. So if Wesley had played knight to e7, I'll, I'll give you guys a hot take. I think if Wesley had played knight e7, there's a very good chance that Wesley would have won this match. I, I will say that. So Wesley plays knight to b4 instead, which is a mistake, because now I can put the knight... Oh, I thought knight e5 was a great move. Shows how little I understand about chess. Apparently, I should have gone knife to h4. I didn't play knife to h4 because I was actually worried about knight e4 and bishop takes e4 with the idea of putting the bishop on g6. But I guess after rook to f4... 
Oh, then black can play knight d3. What is the move here? Wait a second. Ah, it's rook c4, not rook f4. Rook c4 here. Apparently, I'm better. Because if black goes bishop g6, I can take and then go rook to h4, queen h3, line up the double stack and checkmate him at the end of the board. And if he takes with the f pawn here, I can probably take and go like rook f4, claim this open f file, put the bishop on c4, and this should be very good. Again, very, very, very dank stuff, and it's not something that I seriously consider. So instead, I played knight to e5, so I thought, you know what, I've got this great knife in the center of the board, pressure on the f file now, and I'm looking very, I, I feel like I'm doing very, very well. Now, it's funny because when I played knight e5, Wesley actually, I think, started to feel some danger too, because if black, say, moves king h8 here, for example, I can go bishop c4, and now there's quite a bit of pressure here after queen e7 and, say, rook f5 and rook f1, and it just feels like the game is slightly turning to where white is getting a bit of an initiative with all these pieces aiming towards the king side. So Wesley thought for a long time here, and you you cannot express you cannot I cannot really explain the amount of relief I had when Wesley finally played his next move because I really felt like I was running on fumes throughout the day. I felt like Wesley was pressing every game. I was in a lot of trouble in both the black games, and so when Wesley played this move, Queen takes D two, or actually let me set it up right before Wesley played Queen takes D two here, I saw him look up very briefly at me with that sort of quizzical look. Like, well, he didn't turn the head the way that I do, but he looked up just a little bit like with the eyes squinted a touch. And as soon as he did that, I had a feeling that he was going to play his next move, which was queen takes pawn. Because when you do that, whether it's myself, whether it's Anish, Geary, Wesley, or almost anyone else, when you have that like quizzical look, you look up a bit at your opponent, you're like you have that, that bit of a frown. It's like you're thinking your opponent has blundered. They've missed something. So when Wesley played queen takes d2, I was thrilled and overjoyed because I realized that Wesley had simply missed my next sequence of moves. Now, at first glance, it looks like white is doing, or black is doing well, because if I take the knight on f6, I hang the rook on c1 and lose the game. If I play knight c4, attacking the queen, black does not go queen d7, because then I can take the knight due to the pin, but black can simply go queen to d8 here. Oh, apparently this is, and apparently after knight d6, I'm still doing very well. So maybe, maybe actually queen takes d2 was a huge blunder because I had multiple ways to win. I guess knight c4 and knight d6 was apparently also good. Let me just run this through. Bishop c8, bishop f3, rook b8, knight takes f7, and I create a fossil. Pretty dank, pretty, pretty, pretty dank stuff to win like this. But it does show that at this point, Wesley was definitely struggling because he, because there was another win here for me as well. But after queen takes d2, I played rook f d1. The queen has no squares, really. You can't take on e3. There goes the queen. Take on e2, you lose the queen as well. So the only square is queen b2. And now after knight to c4, Wesley has trapped his Pokemon. The queen is simply trapped on b2. You have nowhere to go with the queen. Knight covers the a3 square. If you take the knight, rook captures. If you capture the bishop, I take the queen. Capture the pawn, I take the queen. So your queen is simply trapped here on b2, and Wesley decides to resign the game here. Now, obviously, very, very tough for Wesley to lose like this. I mean, really a tragedy considering the, the generally really high quality of play throughout all of our games uh, here in the American Cup. But at the end of the day, Wesley does make the final blunder. I win the second game of in the 10 minutes plus 5 seconds, and that means there are no more games. It is sudden death elimination. Wesley loses, and with that, I win the 2023 American Cup. So overall, I'm very, very happy. It was very, very grueling, very tough. I don't think that there was any big difference between Wesley or myself. I would actually argue that I think that on the first day, I was uh, on the, f the first match we played, I think I was a little bit better in the critical moments when I beat him in the champions bracket. Yesterday, I think I was actually better than Wesley. It's just that I lost my nerve at those cr at that critical point in the um, in the first tiebreaker game in the Berlin. And of course, Wesley won that game, won the match. But I would say that today, I think Wesley was very clearly the better player. So I was definitely a little bit lucky that today with the match score being 1-1, that he made this blunder that I was able to win. Because I think, I think Wesley was the superior player today. I will just say that. But, you know, it is, what it is we play the game of chess and i end up winning the whole event with it i win um i think i win sixty thousand dollars so i win ten thousand dollars for winning the champions bracket another fifty thousand bananas for winning overall so a very very successful tournament for me that being said you guys uh, for anyone who's wondering, it will not change anything for me. I'm not suddenly going to go try to play every Grand Chess Tour event, try to prove that I'm some great chess player. Those days are all but gone for me. These days, I am a streamer first. And on that note, you guys, I will also say there will be a very big announcement coming in the next couple of days. So make sure that you stay tuned, whether it's to my Twitch channel, whether it's to YouTube, Twitter, wherever. We have a very big announcement, which I will talk about more in the coming days. At any rate, I hope you guys have enjoyed this very long and hefty recap of this final match day against Grandmaster Wesley So. And make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already. And I'll be back with some more great content in the very near, in the very near future.
See you guys soon. Bye.